Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Mark Headley, your host for today. And um, we are going to do a continuation of our series, the next episode of our series, Scientology Executives. And we are going to do a part two on Jenny Linson um, because there was so much to cover, we couldn't do it all in one episode. And to do that, uh, I'd like to bring in my lovely wife, Claire. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me on, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so in our last episode about Jenny, we pretty much covered everything up until um, not only where we had left uh, the Scientology headquarters in 2005, but then um, we covered a bunch of her other uh, history and other stories that we knew about her. And um, we did get a lot of people who wrote into us and even some people that commented publicly on YouTube that knew her. And um, I wanted to bring those up and then you can read those, okay? Okay, sounds good. Okay, so here's our next episode, Jenny Linson part two. Okay, I have to put up that uh, that fun graphic there. Um, okay, so the first one, you want to read All that right, first yep. one? And I'll Fish tell you Daddy. who that is. <laughs> okay, Fish Daddy 35. When Jenny said, every inch of my husband's body, quote unquote, she held her hands about 12 inches apart, which was unintentionally hilarious. <laughs> yeah, and somebody, of course, somebody, she actually held it a lot more than 12 inches, but somebody uh, did a shoot of that. And uh, it's on the internet there. So. <laughs> I knew every inch of Tom DeVoc. Oh my gosh! And then oh they gosh. show her, her 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 hands about three feet apart. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure that that is Jeff Hawkins. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, Fish Daddy 35. Sorry okay. if I added you, Jeff. Um, it does have a. Uh, well, it has a little icon there, which I think is a picture of Jeff. Yeah. But uh, if I'm mistaken, I'm sorry, Jeff. But uh, that's what <laughs> I thought of when I saw that. And it is funny. And somebody did go ahead and uh, and and shoot that up there for us. Um, and then um, the next comment I saw. All right. So Skip Press. Pretty sure Jenny is the daughter of Art Linson, producer of Fight Club and other movies. Her aunt is the former Donna Linson, Art's sister, who is married to composer Mark Isham. Did I say that right? You Isham? did. Oh, and I didn't know amazing. that. I knew Donna, who Donna Isham was, but I yeah. didn't know that she was um, Jenny's aunt. That's right. kind of wild. Because that they is also, wild. They also got uh, ripped off by uh, Reed Slatkin. We talked about there was a, uh, a big science, Scientology fraudster by the name of Reed Slatkin who was running a Ponzi scheme. And I want to say probably 90% of the victims in the Ponzi scheme were Scientologists and even some Sea Org members. And I'm pretty sure that uh, Donna and Mark Isham also uh, lost a, a few uh, a few bits of dough in that whole thing. Yeah, I will comment. It never ceases to amaze me how small Scientology actually is when you delve into the crossovers and the connections and all that. It, it just grows smaller by the second. Yeah, that's true. Okay, then the next one I saw, you're going to... Get yep, CC Kruchko Smith. Jenny kicked me out on her way up AO's elevator to brief the captain on the June 1997 masturbation mission. I have no clue the actual mission name. She gave me only 15 minutes to gather my things and exit. Thus, I missed the crew briefing. Hmm. Do you remember that when she went down to Los Angeles in the 90s? Yes, I it was, do. It was like an ethics mission that she they were running down there. I, I don't remember if it was before or after when they had that whole big Incom flap. This uh, was income. after that. Incom, yeah. The Incom flap was in 1995. Yeah, um, so and I do remember when Jenny went to LA and it was like, uh, she, it was called Pack Attack or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually based on an earlier um pack attack that had been directed by hubbard if i remember correctly um <clears throat> because hubbard had always labeled pack as out ethics right yep meaning they're they're a bunch of you know non-compliant not getting anything done which is really insulting but <laughs> it was well, 
the yeah, origins he, were from Hubbard, not from Jenny Linson, or even from David Miscavige in the, in this case. He just was continuing the Hubbard tradition. Yeah, and, and for anybody who's watching who doesn't know, we, we have slipped into a little bit of abbreviations here, but um, Scientology has a very large complex of buildings in Los Angeles that are all painted blue in the Sunset and Fountain uh, Sunset and Edgemont, sort of that area. And um, and that is where the street, there's one block of a street called L. Ron Hubbard Way. And that is generally referred to as the complex or big blue. Or if you're in the Sea Org, uh, the Sea Organization, those are the guys that signed the billion year contracts to work for Scientology. That uh, building down, those buildings in Los Angeles comprise what's called uh, PAC, the Pacific Area Command. And um, it's a bunch of sea organization um, buildings and, and facilities that are all in the exact same spot. And, um, and at the base, we would, I mean, if you got uh, busted from the Ant headquarters and you went to the Rehabilitation Project Force, um, a lot of times, um, for many years, there was a Rehabilitation Project Force at the international headquarters, but um, it kept being videoed and covered by media organizations. So they shut the entire thing down. And anybody that was stayed on the Rehabilitation Project Force, they went to PAC instead. And if you did, if you ended up getting sent to the RPF from the Ant base, we called it being you're going to be black and PAC because all the RPFers wear uh, black t-shirts and black shorts and black boots and black socks and they run around and uh, do hard labor and all that kind of stuff. So black and pack was meaning you're going to go to the RPF and it's going to be in pack. And so many people ended up going, we were talking about this the other day because so many people would go to the rehabilitation project force in LA that David Miscavige stopped assigning people to the RPF because the the Rehabilitation Project Force, a labor reprogramming camp, was considered a vacation from the Ant base. So he was like, I'm, you're not going to get off easy and, and go to the RPF. You're going to stay here and do something and do things that are w even worse than having to go to the Rehabilitation Project Force. Yes. Okay, last comment here, I think. All and right. Richard Palermo, nine. 9020. She was vicious when she confronted Marty at the airport. Yes, indeed. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today because we thought, hey, what better way to describe Jenny than let Jenny describe herself? Yeah, that's in exactly. Jenny's words. <laughs> yeah. We're not, I mean, in the last episode, we did a bunch of her history. We covered some pieces of that affidavit that she wrote that said David Miscavige has never done anything ever. He's never been violent ever in the history of David Miscavige, which is anyone who's been spent any amount of time at the International Headquarters of Scientology and spent uh, day, e days or hours with David Miscavige, um, that's 99% of how David Miscavige is. Right. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, if you were to add up all the hours and minutes that you dealt with him, I would say there's a very, very tiny percentage of that where he wasn't screaming and yelling and beating somebody up and, and just being a generable, horrible human being. Right. Um, so it's ironic that Jenny, of all people, who's witnessed very arguably more episodes of David Miscavige being violent and 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 not effusive in his compassion, but the exact opposite of that. For her to then write an affidavit and say that he's never ever done that is it's laughable. Right. And and let's let's just talk about numbers for a moment. According to Jenny's affidavit that we covered in the last episode, she has as of today been in the C organization for 39 years and she has worked at Miscavige's side or directly with him for 38 of those years. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she literally would know better than anybody that he is violent. Yep. And, and he and, assaults people on a regular basis. Right. Exactly. And the two other th comments I just wanted to make number one, in regards to the, the Scientology base pack that we talked about, I believe that that is the second largest single concentration of Sea Org members in the world, second to flag. Would you agree with that? Second yeah, to I mean, Clearwater, you, Florida. 
yeah, the 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 flag location is <clears throat> the flag location uh, or the Florida Clearwater Florida location. It has a lot of organizations similar to the the Big Blue or the Compex or PAC. Um, it has the International Association of Scientologists, and it has the Flag Land Base, which is like the Flag Crew and the Flag Service Organization. It has all these different organizations, but there's no organization in Clearwater where you can get into Scientology. It's all people that have been in Scientology for uh, many years that go up the the different training and processing levels of Scientology. And when you get to a certain point, the only place that delivers the upper levels of Scientology is the Clearwater location. That's a, in stark contrast to the Los Angeles area of organizations because there's LA Org and there's the Advanced St. Hill Organization and there's the Advanced American. Organization. And so they have like, there's many organizations where you can go in and you can do a test or you can do it a beginner course and those sort of things. So, but it is, but that is exactly correct. Between those two locations are a majority, a vast majority of the C organization members, the guys that signed the billion year contract, they're in Los Angeles or they're in Clearwater. And then when you start to spread out to the Eastern United States base and the Canada base and the EU and the UK, they may have anywhere from 50 to 100 Sea Org members at those locations, whereas there's thousands in Los Angeles and thousands in, um, in Clearwater. Yes, exactly. And remember that LA, um, at least the, the members of the Sea Organization that live at that blue complex, it also includes, to my knowledge, Scientology media productions probably, and the staff who work at the Hollywood Guarantee Building on Ivar and Hollywood Boulevard. That's right. And you have author yeah. services and right. you have um, another IAS office and you have there's a free winds office there. So there's probably I would say if there was 25 different Sea Org organizations in Los Angeles, that that's going to be very close to the amount yes. that's there. Oh, and Bridge, um, Bridge Publications. Yeah. So and they many. also have Galaxy Press, which is kind of an offshoot of it's where they do L. Ron Hubbard's fiction books and they have to pay tax on those. And it's a for profit business. So those Sea Org members, even though they signed the billion year contract and all that, those Sea Org members, uh, I mean, last I heard they were getting minimum wage as as well as uh, author services and some of these other sea org organizations but um but yeah there's definitely thousands and thousands of uh sea org members that are there once uh, well, to get back to jenny the um we don't have any more comments that we're going to bring up but one of the other things that i did want to say is that um when scientology is in a legal battle with someone and david miscavige gets named in the suit um scientology almost unanimously when he's involved they say he doesn't have anything to do with scientology he doesn't he doesn't run scientology he has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day activities of scientology and when they do these um affidavits these phony affidavits the one that we covered in the last video with jenny she's talking about how he was cover doing everything he was do anything that good that happened in scientology was because david miscavige was directing or managing or controlling or designing what was happening which is in stark contrast to what scientology argue when he gets involved in illegal so it really scientology does this all the time when when they get attacked for their front groups like narconon and the way to happiness and criminon and applied scholastics they say oh no this is um these are non-profit um arms of scientology that are trying to help people in the world and we do all this and scientology um when when people accuse them of not doing anything for the public they say no we have all these these organizations and they list narconon and apply they list all these and then when they're being sued when those organizations are getting sued saying oh you guys are part of scientology they say oh no 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 we don't have anything to do with scientology we're just a we're just a a, a social betterment group that uses the 
the nonfiction works based on the nonfiction works of L. Ron Hubbard, but we don't have anything to do with Scientology. So yeah. they do this all the time, depending on who's having the conversation with them. The truth morphs into the into the truth that's better in that situation. It's never that's right. Yeah. It's never, and, yes, those are our guys, and that's just the end of it. No, no, depending on who's asking, those aren't our guys. <laughs> yeah, and remember that they even created secular materials where they carefully edited Hubbard's words to remove any Scientological terms to yes. be able to claim, see, no, it's not, this is nothing to do, nothing to do with Scientology. And yet it is, as we know, it's just a, a front group intended to lure people into a very dangerous organization. Yeah, I remember there was a lawsuit that was happening um, with some of the uh, people that passed away, the families of, of people that passed away while they were in a Narconon facility in Oklahoma. And I remember meeting with the main attorney in that case, and he was like, we, we're having a hard time proving that these materials are Scientology materials. And I was like, oh, that's a piece of cake. And he's like, what do you mean? I go, all of the courses in Narconon or the courses they have in, in Applied Scholastics, all of these things, they're just distilled versions of Scientology courses that have been watered down for Narconon. And all you have to do is just get the other course that's the Scientology version and just put them side by side. And you can see it's clear as day. Oh, this is the exact document, but here's the watered down work. And here's the, and then um, I think once we had that conversation, I want to say within a, uh, within a few months after that, Scientology ended up settling that uh, case with those victims. So, nice. um, but yeah, so the only reason we, that I wanted to bring this up is that that's the, this is the exact same thing that these guys are doing when they're talking about Scientology and they're defending David Miscavige. The truth is, is sort of, uh, it's a very liquid um, asset that Scientology deals with. It morphs depending on who's asking the questions. And, and we're going to play you a video. I'm trying to remember which is first, the CNN or the airport. Is the CNN thing the first one? Yep, CNN. Okay, so we're gonna play some videos, and this is, and we'll, and I'll put a link to the full video. I've edited this um, hour-long program to just play you the Jenny parts, the Jenny Linson parts, and then after we play this, um, and then we will discuss, and we'll bring up, uh, we'll, we'll we'll come back around to see how this works out. Um, okay, let me see if I can do this right. If I I got to make sure I got the right one. Here. Personally, oh. that's Tom DeVox. Okay, so let me just make sure I put, start this at the beginning. Okay, so this is from um, a CNN show that Anderson Cooper uh, did, and it was called Scientology, A History of Violence. And the, the women that you see on the screen there are Jenny Linson in the front and center. And then next to her is Ann Rathbun in black. And then behind her in the the, the court of sort of uh, tan uh, suit is Kathy. Her name was Kathy Hawkins when we knew her. And I don't remember what her, uh, what she Kathy Frazier. Kathy Frazier. And then you have Kathy Rinder um, that we knew as, and now she's Kathy Bernardini. And yep. so the four husbands of these women, ex-husbands of these women, um, we're exposing Miscavige for vi his violence and beating people up and, and all the things that were going on. And in this show, they pretty much pin all violence on Marty Miscavige or Mar Marty Rathbun, Marty Miscavige, um, <laughs> Marty McFly. Yeah, there you Marty, go. Marty, Marty Rathbun. Um, they <laughs> pin all the violence on Marty in a, like a three year period. It's the weirdest thing. It's like from 2000 to 2003, Marty was the one beating up all, everybody. And right. during that time, Marty was brought to, uh, he was basically brought into a position by David Miscavige where he was his direct henchman. So like Marty would go meet with Miscavige. Miscavige would say, you need to go and deal with um, Billy Bob. And then D Marty would go beat the crap out of Billy Bob and get him investigated and, and interrogated and all this. And then he would directly report back to Miscavige within minutes of the beating. And so, yeah, and, but not only that, 
each of these, the four husbands or four ex-husbands, we should say, that of these women had all been directly assaulted physically by David Miscavige himself, in addition to yes. Marty. Like, it's not that, it's not that, like, they had personal knowledge and had personally experienced David Miscavige's abuse. Yeah, and I want to say that at least, so th this is also a key thing to say. So all four of these uh, women were posted at the international headquarters, but only the three, the two in front and Kathy in the, in the back row, they were in international management or religious technology center. And Kathy was in golden era productions and she was in the public relations department of, and in the sales department, she was in gold. She was only in golden era productions. She was never, um, when, at least when I was there, she was never in international management. Um, she was, she, in the, she was originally brought there. Yeah. I think, I think she may have very briefly been intended to hold a management position, but she very quickly was eliminated from that. By oh. David Miscavige. Yep, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because she had, remember, she, she had worked on the free wins. Yeah. Um, her, yeah. I want to say it was, she had a different name when she, I think Kathy was, D. Simone. Yes. Kathy D. Simone. And, um, and yes, yeah, she was brought because she was a, a great public relations person for the free winds. So it was like, oh, we should bring her to the base. And I think the original intention that she was going to be inter international management public relations or some high executive post. Yep, and within right. within a few weeks of her getting there to 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 on what do you call it on board to that post or whatever, um, she ended up in golden air productions and she ended up in sales at first. She wasn't always in the public relations. She had to kind of, uh, she had to, she had to grind for a few years in the sales department. And then she was eventually transitioned to the, uh, port captain or the, the public relations department. And I think that was only after the guy that was doing that post ended up getting sent to the re re uh, rehabilitation project force. Yep. She essentially replaced a guy named Ken Hoden who got busted from the port captain post G golden air productions. And then she became the, uh, the port captain or whatever it was. Right. But, yeah. um, I'm going to play this. It's just, it's only a few minutes and um and we'll try to be quiet while it's playing, but we might uh, chirp in or I might pause it depending on what they say. <laughs> um so but the re that was the setup. So the, all of their four husbands have already appeared with Anderson or have already spoken with Anderson and now Anderson is going to confront them on David Miscavige beating all these people up and then listen to how they spin it and then when it's done we'll kind of fill in the blanks. As we mentioned earlier, it took top church leaders until today to sit down with us without any preconditions to discuss the allegations against their leader. They, along with the ex-wives of the men you just saw, say Marty Rathbun is lying, that he was the violent one. They called him bitter and angry, the man who had him removed from his position in the church. Now here's an excerpt of the interview with the ex-wives. I asked them about some affidavits signed by senior church leaders that indicated a number of violent incidents stretching over several years. No police were ever called, no charges were ever filed. And the church claims the leader of the church had no idea it was happening at the time. In 2003, it came up that Marty Rathbun had been mistreating others. And at that so point for, in time... So for about three years, according to members of the church, mm -hmm. your husband was physically assaulting... It was, in, it was isolated incidents. It well, this isn't isolated incidents. This is a consistent, virulent uh, physical harassment. That's from their aff affidavits that they say... Marty was consistently violent. And then they're trying to spin it that, no, 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 it was just isolated instances and David Miscavige didn't know anything about it. Right. Um, and and just to add one piece of information too, um, factor in, so I was brought into Religious Technology Center in March of 1996. And that same month is the first time that I personally witnessed David Miscavige physically abuse a staff member at that time was Ray Midoff. So now just, I'm just putting that for context when they say, Oh, this was just isolated instances over the last three years. No, I'm, I'm saying I personally witnessed the first, the, the first time David Miscavige physically assaulting a staff member in March of 1996, very shortly after arriving into religious technology center. 
Yeah. And the first time I saw David Miscavige assault somebody was in 1990, just a few months after I got to the Int property, Int based property. And that person was Mark Fisher, which right. we've talked about this before. Uh, and exactly. And it's in my book, Blown for Good Behind the Iron Curtain Scientology. But um, okay, let's keep going. Okay. Yeah, you're that. We understand what you're saying. <laughs> so they've, <laughs> they've given him the stack of affidavits that says that Marty was beating people up full time. And now he's saying this guy was beating people up full time. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Because now it's they're right there. It's already been flipped back on them. And you, you see Jenny's like. Uh, 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 uh. And here's the, the what, what I'm saying is that you 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 were married to a man who for three years had a, was a high ranking member of the church who was assaulting people and 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 Mr. Nothing Miscavige, seems to be done about it. Mr. Miscavige was not at the, at the property at the time. Do you not have telephones? <laughs> of course we have telephones. So I, I think you, you're being quite rude and quite insulting. Here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. There is no history of violence in the church. That there was isolated instances, and yes, you have that you do have written declarations that Marty Rathman was a violent man. He was a violent, psychotic man. Okay, so that's just an excerpt of kind of setting it up for them to then show all these different affidavits. But um, they say the, the whole show is called The History of Violence because there's a history of violence. And, that's they, right. and Scientology tries to spin it, and they do this all the time at the international headquarters. Whenever somebody escapes or whenever somebody is sent to the re rehabilitation project force, anything bad that happened within a certain period of time that can be blamed on that person gets blamed on that person and then david miscavige will usually say well now that this person's gone we know that that was the source of all of the problems in this area and so he would be the source david miscavige would be the source of problems in that area and then as soon as that person would escape or get assigned to the rehabilitation project force, then that person, and they call it um, a head on a pike. In exactly. I was just going to say that. I was like, that's Hubbard's terminology for it. I mean, I'm sure that's taken from elsewhere, like many other things, but yeah. Essentially, the idea is that there is a head on a pike in the middle of the village and don't do what that guy did because he, he ended up with a head on a pike. Okay, so... And, and by the way, that head on a pike always would result in, so for example, when Marty Rathbun blew and escaped on his motorcycle in 2003, then there were hundreds of reports written by staff on, on the entire property going, Marty did this, 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 Marty did this. And then they would also take Marty's confessions that until he escaped from Scientology were priest, penitent, confidential, privileged information that would never be shared. And then they combine all of that and compile a hate website. Yeah. And so, and because you're writing those things and you're saying, yes, well, in a lot of cases you're getting interrogated or you're in some sort of trouble. And the only way to get out of that trouble is for you to write up anything and everything that you've ever done that would be a non survival activity or an overt or a withhold against David Miscavige or Scientology. And then, and then they keep all that. They keep all those records very handy for when you escape and then they get people to write reports on you and then they take those and then they, that's how they build a hate website against you. And, um, and, but the thing that's funny to me is that we're talking about decades and decades of violence at the hands of David Miscavige. This this program took place in like 2010. Right. So um, is it 2010? Yeah, it's 2010 yes. when Anderson Cooper did this. So there now it's so this is seven, six years after Marty Rathbun has left. And now Marty and Tom and Mike and Jeff and us and all kinds of people are saying, yeah, these guys, David Miscavige is violent as hell. And they're saying, no, 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 it was Marty. And you're like, well, okay, but that you're talking about 20 years. You guys have, you, you're just picking out three years to blame it on Marty. And now Marty's been long gone since 2004. And the violence continued after Marty left, verified by these people. Like Tom DeVock left and after Marty did, so did Jeff Hawkins, so did Mike Rinder. So right. it's sort of like, well, how is David Miscavige beating up 
um, Mike Rinder through Marty if Marty had left. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's not a lot. You guys aren't making all, all the sense here. No. Okay, let's put this back. Affidavits from current and former church members, one-time colleagues of these former Scientologists, even their ex-wives. All these affidavits swear David Miscavige never hurt anyone. I slept with Tom DeVock for almost 20 years. I knew every inch of him. I never saw one scratch. I never saw one bruise. I never saw one black eye. Nothing. Tom, Nor did he complain Tom. about anything personally. That's Tom DeVock's ex-wife, Jenny Linson. She agreed just this week to be interviewed along with the ex-wives of Mark Rathbun, Jeff Hawkins, and Mike Rinder. I read all of your affidavits. Obviously, your ex-husbands have made charges against David Miscavige, saying that they have seen repeated acts of physical violence perpetrated by Mr. Miscavige. Is any of that true? No, no. not one no. ounce of it. Not one. Why, why do you think they're saying these things? I think that they are bitter individuals who once had a life that had glory and some form of power, and they now have nothing. They have no job. They have no life. And the media is giving them attention. Now, that is a thing. If you, when we show the next video, whenever David Miscavige sends people out to defend or to explain why these people are attacking, they always say, you're nothing. You have no life. You have no job. You have no family. They, th this is for those people. It's not for everybody else. It's just for those people to make it like, remember, you left and now you're nothing. And they, and this is a common theme that you'll hear when, and whenever these people go out and attack people. And they're going for that attention. But we personally know, I mean, I slept with Tom DeVock for almost 20 years. I knew every inch of him. If he ever complained about something, if he had a headache, if he had a backache, he had me rub his feet at night. I mean, I was his wife. I never saw one scratch. I never saw one bruise. I never saw one black eye, nothing. Nor did he complain about anything personally. Even though she was at those meetings when he was beating up on these people. Yeah, why would he complain to her when she's there? <laughs> she, she watched it happen. Right. And he would have told me because any, anything that would happen, <laughs> I would know about. And besides that, that's not the character of Mr. David Miscavige. Nothing like that. It's outrageous that these men are doing that and they're bitter and they're getting attention from the media. How is it that no one came forward I will answer to call Anderson. the police? I will, answer, I will tell you. At that point in time, he had a personal conversation with me and said to me, and, I, I, and said to me specifically as he was bouncing his knee nonstop, Jenny, I think I'm going nuts. I think I'm crazy. And we thought, okay, we can help this man. We're going to have to help him with Scientology technology. Mm -hmm. It wasn't days later that he took off. So I, what is the procedure for dealing with somebody who is physically violent? Because in any corporation in the United States, if, uh, if a superior assaulted, punched, kicked, strangled, uh, you know, somebody else in the company, that person would be out of the company and the police would be called. And what? he is out. And he was out. That's what you have to understand, Anderson. So for about three you see that? They, they, they literally twist and, t and turn it like he is out. Well, not because you guys kicked him out. He escaped on a motorcycle right, and, so and he was dragged. They dragged him back. That was like the third time he escaped and they didn't get him back the third time. The, time, the two times before that, that Marty escaped, they got him back. Right. And, uh, and I just love, like, what is this now? The third time that Anderson has asked, why did nobody call 911? And yeah. there's not one single answer because the actual answer is nobody at that property can call 911. That's exactly. the actual answer. Yeah. For years, according to members of the church, mm -hmm. your husband was physically assaulting. It was in, it was isolated incidents. It well, this is an isolated incident. This is a consistent, virulent uh, physical harassment. Yeah, you're... That, we understand what you're saying, yeah. and here's the, the fact. No, what, what I'm saying is that you, 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 you were married to a man who, for three years, had a, was a high-ranking member of this church who was assaulting people, and and, and Mr. nothing Miscavige, seems to be done about it. Mr. Miscavige was not at the, at the property at the time. Do you not have telephones? <clears throat> of course we have telephones. So I, I think you, you're being quite rude and quite yeah. insulting. Here's the bottom line. 
Here's the bottom line. There is no history of violence in the church. That there was isolated instances, and yes, you have that you do have written declarations that Marty Rathman was a violent man. Okay, so that is the end of that video um, uh, on the CNN show. And I've put a link in the description to the entire video if you want to watch the whole thing. Um, we only just chopped the Jenny specific portions out of that video. Um, now, there was the other thing I wanted to say was there was another incident that took place with Jenny Linson. Um, that was when her and a bunch of other executives uh, ambushed Mike Rinder when he was at a, a doctor uh, appointment. And we were going to play that, but we had, in order to play it, we'd literally have to bleep, bleep just about every single word that Jenny said. So we're just going to put a link to that as well. And you can, you can watch that or listen to that, what, whatever you like. But um, that was another thing. And in that it was, you're nothing. You don't, you're, you, you left everybody. You disconnected from your family. It's just a, a more attacking of Mike, but in front of all these other people, including his brother, his daughter, um, his ex-wife, Kathy. Um, and there was another individual, I think Dave Bloomberg was there as well. There was a bunch of people. Sue Will Hare Gentry was there as well. Yeah, so they just screaming and yelling basically the entire time. Um, okay, so the next clip that we have, and this was another clip that uh, people commented on and people wanted to see, was uh, Marty Rathbun in 2014 was, um, he was either leaving Los Angeles or he was arriving. I think he was leaving Los Angeles to fly back to Texas. Yeah, it was, he, no, it was 2012, 2012. It was, you sure? Yep. Hmm. I have 2014. It's either 2012 or it's 2014, folks. Um, we were shooting a movie. Marty and I were both shooting a movie with Louis Thoreau uh, called My Scientology Movie. And it was, uh, and I think I want to say that's when this occurred, about the time this occurred, or in that time period. And Marty was at LAX, Los Angeles International Airport. Now, Scientology, um, the entire time I was there, they had their, um, not, well, not the entire time I was there, they used to use other travel agents, but in, a, in the early 90s, Scientology set up their own travel agency within the C organization that could book tickets on any airline going anywhere and they could look up reservations and they could do all that they had a they had a portal into that system and they could see who was on those planes they wouldn't be able to see the entire name but if they knew the person that they were looking for they could easily see that that person was on the flight or not on the flight or what seat they had um and we've talked about this in other We've talked about this in a lot of other episodes because there was a time when uh, Jay, my good friend Jason Begay and I were traveling to Germany and they had private investigators that were in the two seats behind us on the plane to, uh, on an international flight. So um, they're able to see when people are going to travel. That's the moral of the story. So for these three people to just accidentally, coincidentally show up at the airport at the same time Marty was there is not an accident. And likely I would, I would, I would wager they weren't going anywhere. They just brought some bags to the airport and they got flights. They can book flights and then they can go to the airport, go through security and then go to where the same place Marty's going. And then as soon as they confront him and he, he takes off, then they just get back in the car and they drive back to the base and they just refund the ticket. Tickets. Right. So, and and not to state the obvious, but LAX has five different terminals at least, right? Um, it's, I mean, it's a huge a sprawling airport. And personally, when it comes to coincidences and Scientology, I don't believe there is such a thing. Yeah. When, when Jason Begay and I traveled to Germany, they met us at the check-in. Like before we even got to security, they were there with with placards and and handouts unfortunately they brought everything they brought they had made for germany so everything was in german 
So they were going to hand these out when we went to go speak to the German government and all these other European governments. And, um, and so they gave us these broadsheets that they had, they had, they'd worked up about us, these hate broadsheets and they were in German. So I'm like, I don't speak German. I can't read any of this. They, they were trying to, you know, intimidate us with all these things. I'm like, that's a, that's a nice picture of me, but I don't, I can't read anything else that you've got on there. Right. And, um, and so, and, but how and would the they versions, know? The, yeah. The versions of those broadsheets, I think it bears mentioning that they handed out to our landlord at the time in Burbank, California, they had pasted over the German headlines with English, but then all the text was still in German. So still yes. it was, it was just bizarre. Yeah. It was definitely like, they didn't think about the, we should make this in English as well. Right. <laughs> okay. Let's play. Um, let's play this and hopefully it won't, it, they like to play right as I stick them up there. Okay, good. So, um, okay. So this is, Mark Yeager, Jenny Linson, and Dave Bloomberg are the three people in this video. And the person videoing, uh, out of focus, I will tell you, is Marty. And I think Marty was recording this with his phone. And whenever you record something with your phone, this is just a hot tip to any uh, uh, struggling videographers out there. You got to take that phone and you got to you got to hit those cameras with uh, with your shirt or with a, a sleeve or something. You got to wipe that off, otherwise it's going to look like this. Okay, and this one is Jenny. Um, you'll see the hierarchy of these three in this video because Jenny is the one who's leading this little attack. And when she, when they walk away and she walks back, then they both, Mark and Dave, both walk back. And you'll see it as we play the video. We'll just let this one play and then we'll we'll yap at the end. Works great, doesn't it? it makes you feel good. You know, you could. Can... You can actually get your address to Marty. That would be a change. Stop committing suppressive acts. Full time suppressive acts. Full time. Also, who travels with a video camera? Like we're just going to accidentally run into somebody and video it. You've had zero effect. None. And nobody gives a fuck about you. That's the truth. Uh, we are doing so well. It's so scary, man. Nobody like has even noticed you're gone, man. Nobody. It, you're nothing. That's the point. And you're it, nothing. No contact holes. Is that what you learned? Brilliant. No contact Your TRs holes. are brilliant. Why don't you just stop committing suppressed facts and live a real life? What's he doing in LA anyway? What are you doing in LA? Why are you here? What a, Why don't you just end it and start living a decent life and do something to help mankind? Since you guys do nothing to help mankind, between you, Mike, it's pathetic. You guys are embarrassing and pathetic. Pathetic. Disgusting. And it's all over your face and you look terrible. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Have you ever been longer before a flight? So they walk away. Why don't you do something with your life? You're an embarrassment. An embarrassment to the fact that you were ever, ever connected to us. You can, can, you people, can you people move on, please? That, that was good. It's unbelievable. Can you move on, please? It's absolutely embarrassing to ever be connected. You have no effect. Nobody cares. Nobody's interested. You've done nothing. You have no, I mean, some movement. It's a goddamn joke. No one gives a crap. Okay? Can you, move, can you move on, please? I've moved on. I mean, yeah. Can you guys move on, please? <laughs> That's it, then. That's the end. Um, I'm sorry the audio is so bad. That that the audio and video uh that Marty got there was not uh was embarrassing. But um but yeah, so you'll see they've said they say these things when we have run into these people. They say stop committing overts. Stop committing present time overts. And Nobody stop committing cares. suppressive acts because according to Hubbard, that is what you tell someone who's a quote unquote suppressive person. Stop 
committing suppressive acts. And in fact, that's the first step to becoming not an SP, allegedly, whatever. Yeah, they have they have these steps called the A to E steps. And it goes A, B, C, D, E. And the first step is stop committing present time over to acts. Stop committing suppressive acts. So that is, um, they do that to anybody they run into. They, they said, and I want to even say that in the ambush, there's a video on our channel about them ambushing me um, at the, did we do a video about that? About the Danish, when I was with the Danish film crew, I thought we had done a video about that. No, that. we should definitely do that though. We should definitely do that. And, and, and in that one, we can talk about the many times they ambushed me, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. And, and the I other thing that the Hubbard ambushes. says, <laughs> yeah. The other thing that Hubbard says that you say to a suppressive person is no, you tell them no and tell them stop committing suppressive acts. That's why that, that does, um, frame that conversation as to what Jenny and Mark Yeager and David Bloomberg were doing. And the only other comment that I know that I thought in watching yeah. that video newly is they, they intentionally tried to use the what's called emotional tone scale um, to talk to a person at where they think that person is at on the emotional tone scale developed by Hubbard. So that slimy smile on Mark Yeager's face was intended as 1.1 covert hostility. Yeah. And you'll see, I mean, anytime the Scientologists um, attack or they get caught on video and they're saying these things, they are they have to follow Hubbard's policies or what David Miscavige has told them that they're supposed to do. So they have to kind of make sure you'll see Jenny doesn't really say that much, but she says the same thing over and over again. Yep. And those were the things that she was instructed by David Miscavige. You need to do this. You need to tell him this. And so he's an embarrassment. He means nothing. No one cares. You're embarrassing. All these things she just says in many different ways the same thing over and over again, and um, and that is one hundred percent intended. There's no possibility that those three showed up at LAX the exact same time, the exact same uh, terminal as Marty with, and they had a camera with them. Oh, There's and no they were in the exact same outfits too. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I want to say. Um, depending on when this took place, those three people would, would not usually travel together. That's a no. totally random group of those three people to be traveling to an event or be traveling to an organization opening or anything that they would do. Um, I would say the entire 15 years I was there, those three people never went to the same place at the same time on a plane to do something because... Dave Bloomberg is in a, is in one area. Mark Yeager is the what for traditionally for most of the time he was the commanding officer of the CMO International and Jenny for a lot of that time was the commanding officer of CMO International. But I don't think Jenny was speaking at events necessarily um like my, my like Mark Yeager was and Dave Bloomberg I I want to say he was very rarely on events. He was a PR person, but he wasn't part of the events PR usually. Right. So, and and also we should comment on the fact that, um, as you brought up, the fact that David Bloomberg had a camera and was instantly videoing and filming that, that was for one reason and one reason alone. That's because yeah. that needed to be included with their compliance report, as it's called, to report back to David Miscavige that they did exactly as he instructed. And the only proof of that would be a video. Yeah, that's exactly right. When I, I remember that when I escaped in January, 2005, and you were still there and that they were letting you call me or they were letting you talk to me while listening on the calls, um, you had told me a whole bunch of stuff because Jenny at that time that this was right around the time where you guys had to, you were ordered to make her sleep. It was, it was literally right around that exact same time. Yep. Because you had told me, um, and I heard this from somebody else as well, uh, from the, uh, this guy named Gerald Duncan, who was likely the, vi the, the person that 
between him and David Miscavige was the one who kind of set up my escape. But, um, but after I left, you told me, you said, Jenny said this and what, 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 what exactly, what was the conversation? Yeah. So the next day after you escaped, so you escaped on January 4th and <clears throat> in an unusual situation, they actually did let me go home that night, which was, could have been a, a monumental mistake on their part. Um, however, the only reason it didn't end up being a mistake was because Jenny called me at four o'clock in the morning. And granted, I was half a mile from the property it's, and with a security camera on the top of our house, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not like I was not being watched very closely. But Jenny called up at four o'clock in the morning and she told me that David Miscavige had ordered that you be brought back. And that carried, at the time, significant weight in my world because I had seen many people escape and be brought back at the orders of David Miscavige. So while I had packed a bag at that point and hid it under our bed, um, I had to put my plans on hold because I was under the impression that Jenny was executing David Miscavige's direct order to capture you and bring you back. And Jenny then began a complete investigation as to who had um, been undermining your efforts to get David Miscavige's orders done and did this whole big investigation um, because you were one of the only people that was getting anything done at the time from by David Miscavige's own words. Yeah. And I remember that time, too, because I was I mean, I was slaying it up until I left. I was doing great. I was getting a lot of stuff done and I was building audiovisual systems and they were getting approved and I was doing my thing. And then this whole thing happened and it was like it was, you know, like a, basically a witch hunt. And then um, and then even after that, even the guy, this Gerald Duncan guy, he was like, we messed up. You weren't you weren't supposed to be in trouble. This was a big misunderstanding. And then I was just like, whatever, I'm never coming back. And then you get on the phone and then you're just like, yeah, Jenny said, um, Dave, Dave said that you're not in trouble. You can come back. And I was just like, oh, well, then I know I'm never coming back because if David Miscavige said that, then it's bull because that dude never gets it right. Never. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you were you were frying my ears at that moment. I was like, ah, please stop talking. I cannot repeat these words. Um, but yeah, the other the other thing that I remember telling you is I said David Miscavige said you'll get all the staff you need to get everything done, and you were like, oh, well then that guarantees that I'm not going to get any staff. <laughs> yeah, because everything that David Miscavige orders most of the time never happens or it takes decades to happen because it's just, it's a crazy thing when you work at that place because there's a hundred things to get done and there's 20 people that are doing it. And all he does is he moves those 20 people around those hundred things endlessly. So nothing gets done. Everything gets a little done instead of just saying, okay, we have 10 things to do. Let's have 20 people work on those 10 things. And so everyone's always spread too thin and everyone's always staying up all night. And because you stayed up all night, you didn't sleep. And because you didn't sleep, you mess up the thing. And then it's like a big investigation. Why did this get messed up? And it's like, well, they haven't slept in two weeks. So that's why there's typos because their brains don't work. And it's just, always just it, it's a never ending. Just, uh, it's like a, uh, it's just a rat, rat race. race. <laughs> it's just a rat race that just- yep sort of just like this is never it's the most inefficient way to do things and then in the midst of that you're going to get beat up so like you can work 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 and then it's going to fail and then you're all going to get in trouble some people are going to get beat up and then it just resets and it's just with a different group of people and then when they get busted and they get beat up then it's like okay bring the bring the the last crew back in and then the last crew have all been refreshed and it's like okay now you guys are up and you're just like oh man here we go yep here we go again so thank you for everybody who commented on the uh the last video we did of jenny we're making a list of all the different executives we're definitely going to do mark yeager um, we're going to do Angie Blankenship, probably David um, Bloomberg, David Bloomberg. Um, we'll do all the heavy hitters 
And um, and we think we're going to take the people that have done that. If you if if an executive in Scientology did one of these affidavits, likely those are the people that we're going to uh, we're going to try to cover because they're there. It's one thing when you say, OK, well, yeah, but there was all these other people that, that were there and did. Well, yeah, that's the difference between the different types of people. If you work there for 15 years and like me, I worked in audiovisual. So um, I saw things, uh, you know, that went on that were like, this is crazy. I don't know if this is the way this should be happening. And then when I got out in the real world, I found out, oh yeah, that's not how these things should be happening. And so then I started speaking out about them. The people that have that were part of this, like Angie Blankenship, she saw all these same things. She knows about all the same violence, but she chose to make a deal with Scientology and just go and do that. And no consequences. She does not, she's not exposing anybody. She's not telling anything she saw, illegal. Uh, nefarious, whatever. She's not um, cooperating with law enforcement. She hasn't reported any of the crimes she was involved in or was aware of. Tommy Davis is another person in that category. Yeah. So there's two groups of these people because there's more ex Sea Org members than there are Sea Org current Sea Org members by by many fold. Like if there's five thousand current Sea Org members, there's probably thirty thousand ex Sea Org members that are floating around, um, and probably several hundred of those know about the violence and know about these illegal things that they could easily go to law enforcement and say, "Hey, this guy did this, and this guy did that," and then, you know, you could have your hands clean. But um, and it's not illegal if you did if you. Uh, that's another thing I did want to mention. This kind of ties into that. We had a lot of ex Sea Org and a lot of ex Scientologists contact us um, when we start talking about these, uh, it, the, either the private investigators or the executives. We're getting more Sea Org members and ex Sea Org members and ex Scientologists contacting us, telling us, oh, I knew this and I knew that and I know this person. So, the thing that separates those people are the people that that leave and then go, yeah, there was wrongdoing there, and then they report it. Even if you've signed one of these non-disclosure agreements with Scientology and they paid you fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, it's doesn't that doesn't make it so you cannot report illegal activities to law enforcement. There, there's no NDA that you can sign that prevents you from reporting a crime. To, to, to law enforcement. So that's also something that you could do. You could report to law enforcement and they don't necessarily have to reveal your name. Um, and so you could report the illegal acts that you know and still maintain your, your non-disclosure agreement. Um, and if you do have something like that in place, it's not a bad idea to get that side checked by a lawyer or side checked by somebody that has your best interests uh, in mind. But as far as I know, and I'm not a legal expert, I'm not an attorney, I'm not giving you legal advice, but it is not illegal to report a crime. It's, 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 if anything, it's the other way. You should most likely report it and not let it go by. And that is, that I think is the main determining factor on is this person still you know towing the line for Scientology or are they not if you're reporting Scientology to law enforcement that is a suppressive act in Scientology but if you've left Scientology and you no longer are participating like what's the harm of reporting them to the, the to police or law enforcement so yeah in fact, um, you should it's your responsibility to yeah, and that is one of the ways that Scientology has kept out of trouble is when any of these things are reported, like in the case of this Anderson Cooper thing, you've got a multitudes of ex-members reporting about the violence. The only defense Scientology has against that is a bunch of affidavits. They don't want to get in a they don't want to get into a legal battle with these people because it would open them up to discovery. And then you could get folders and files that they're not allowed to destroy that would then document violence taking place. Yeah. And um, and Scientology, um, they know they know how to navigate this legal arena because they've been doing this for 70 years. They know exactly what they can and can't do um, to stay out of trouble. And, uh, and a lot of times, David Miscavige will ignore those things 
because he wants it done a certain way and he'll tell we're doing it this way and the lawyers you got to figure out how we can do it this way and sometimes that backfires and sometimes it doesn't so it's wild um but yeah we're going to cover some of these other executives who else are we going to do who else should we do if you know of somebody that we didn't mention put it in the comments bleep bloop it in the comments down there if there's somebody that you want to uh, want us to cover and if there's enough material or if we know enough because a lot of these people i mean we worked there for over a decade we know a lot of these people for mm -hmm. years and years and years and so when they write one of these affidavits it's really easy to pick out like all the people that you've seen today the every single one of the people that the inch wives dave bloomberg mark yeager all of these people have all witnessed David Miscavige get physically violent with somebody. Guaranteed. I've been in yep. meetings, in different meetings about different things with all of these people. And I guarantee you that David Miscavige has assaulted somebody in one or many of those meetings that took place. So yeah. It's not and hey, <laughs> and hey, let's just throw out there too. If you knew or worked with any of these executives and want to come and come on and talk with us about it, about your experiences, drop us a message. Yeah, that is the other thing we're going to do. We are going, we've already gotten people that have written uh, ex Sea Org members or ex Scientologists that knew different things that have offered to do this. So every once in a while, one of these exec, one of these executive uh, series videos, Scientology executive uh, series that we do, every once in a while, we're going to get somebody on that worked with that person to just have them tell them us the, the stories. Like we might, we might actually end up doing that for the private investigator series as well, because those people, the private investigators, there's a lot of ex members who've been hounded or even infiltrated. Like some of these private investigators worked at their company. Like right. it's not like they were just watching them and, and get, stealing their garbage every week. They were in the next office over, or they were going on business trips with the ex members pretending like they were literally getting paid by Scientology to spy on these people. And they were getting paid by the ex members company to work there. And so they're double dipping and like a spy, essentially a spy in their company. Right. Okay, guys. Um, is there, did I forget anything? Do we forget any uh, thing about Jenny? I think we covered nope, everything. I think yeah. that covers everything for now. Um, let us know in the comments, uh, if there's, who, what private investigators you want us to cover, what Scientology executives you want us to cover, and um, and we'll tally those up. And if we've got something good that we can uh, make an episode out of, we'll do it. And uh, we'll Oh, put yeah. There. And one last thing to mention. The affidavit uh, from Jenny, we're still searching for the missing pages. So if we hunt that down or if you have a hot lead, please do let yeah. us know because I'm sure there's amazing dastardly material in said yeah, missing pages. Totally. And I did want to mention this. If you do have, if you do find the document and it's link, it's, it's up on the internet somewhere, um, go to the blownforgood.com contact page and you can write a message and send it to us there. And you can also do it anonymously. You can just say, you know, Billy Bob one, two, three, or whatever you want to say without exposing who you are. Um, but if you do it in the comments on a video, if you have a link, YouTube doesn't, um, the way the comments are set up, it flags comments with links in them because it might just be spam or we, we try to not let people put links in there because it's the YouTube comment section is a very ripe area for scams. People pretend to be us. And then they say, Oh, if you want to do this, support this, it's not us. So, um, if you do want to send us a link, Go to the blowforgood.com page, uh, contact page, and then you can uh, get us something there. And then that way it gets through. And um, yeah, I think we're good. Is there if there's nothing else? I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us. And right. um, yeah, if you uh, if you enjoyed this, like and subscribe and all that. Happy hoo ha! And uh, we will see you on the next one. Until next time. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help support the channel, feel free to check out the merch store link in the description. We have Hail Xenu, Xenu is my homeboy, and BFG branded mouse pads, shirts, mugs, all sorts of other stuff in there that helps us to bring you new content on a regular basis. You can also pick up a copy of my book, Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology, in hardback, Kindle, and Audible versions as well. There's also a link to our podcast, 
And you can get that on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to watch another video, you can click on this link right here, or you can click on this one here, or you can click on the subscribe button right here. Thanks a lot. Until next time.